Recall paper of disease or short name Perthes disease pathology and diagnosis. We know leg Calvé and Perthes independently describe it, Perthes disease and Waldenstrom describe it at stages. In the instance uh, regarding age between most commonly seen between age four to eight years, but we have seen Perthes disease between the age of two years up to late teens. Uh, one in 1,200 males are particularly more susceptible to the disease, 5 to 1. Uh, Hips are involved by naturally in 10 to 12 percent of cases, and there appears to be a predilection in certain population, particularly higher incidence in Asians, Eskimos, and Central Europeans, and lower incidence in Native Australians, Native Americans, uh, African Americans, and Polynesians. Regarding the etiology, the calvipersis disease is an idiopathic osteonecrosis of the capital femoral epiphysis with resultant femoral head deformity. The prevailing opinion that the calvipersis disease is a multifactorial disease with genetic and environmental factors playing a role. We know that the, uh, there are several etiologic factors sharing in a common pathologic and clinical presentation. So, regarding the etiology of this, Osteonecrosis might be traumatic, might be inflammatory process, vascular occlusion, thrombophilia, insulin-like growth factor 1 pathway abnormality, maternal smoking, second-hand smoke exposure, or most recently a subtle type 2 collagen mutation theory. Regardless of the cause, disruption of the blood supply to the femoral capital epiphysis and ischemic necrosis appears to be the key pathologic event leading to the pathologic and subsequent structural changes in the femoral head. So the question is whether the calviperthus disease is due to a single event, infarction or multiple episodes of infarctions remains controversial. Regarding the pathology, we have to describe the pathology and the, on the femoral side and on the acetabular side. So on the femoral side, we know that there will be an osteonecrosis or evascular necrosis or evascular stage, so the femoral head will be uh, devoid of plus supply and there will be a femoral head necrosis and then afterwards there will be a revascularization stage with resorption, fragmentation, femoral head collapse and femoral head deformity. In order to understand the uh, patho pathology and pathogenesis of femoral head deformity we have to know our anatomy of the capital femoral epiphysis so we have to know where is the physial plate, the proximal capital epiphysis, the cartilage and the growing cartilage, articular cartilage, the bony epiphysis, and the metaphysis. And therefore, we have to describe our pathology into the pathology affecting the articular cartilage and its growth cartilage, the pathology affecting the bony epiphysis, physial plate, and metaphysial changes. So, like of reparathus disease deformity, to start with articular cartilage, there will be Necrosis of the deep layer of the articular cartilage and the endochondral ossification will stop on the articular side with the growth arrest. And afterwards, there will be the revascularization stage with increased vascular endothelial growth factor and other factors, and result in uh, cartilage revascularization and restoration of physial growth. But unfortunately, many times it is asymmetric uh, uh, growth, and this will accentuate from a deformity subsequently. And then, regarding the bony epiphysis, there will be extensive cell death and increased bone mineral content due to the collapse trapeculi, due to the dystrophic calcification and calcium deposition on the um, dead trapeculi. And this would cause a brittle bone, it's exactly like osteopetrosis. Uh, and this brittle bone is structurally weak, and there will be accumulation of micro damage within it. And then there will be increased revascularization stage with increased bone resorption and delayed bone formation which will cause structural weakness and decrease mechanical strength of the bony epiphysis and the ultimate result will be femoral head collapse and deformity and then at the level of the physis, physial plate due to the cut, due to the uh, insufficiency of the blood supply there will be physial damage and growth arrest as well which would cause coxa vera and coxa brevia and last the metaphysis there are metaphysial cysts and the exact um, pathogenesis of the metaphysial cysts is not known, but they are associated with physical damage. So, the femoral head deformity is a combination of femoral head collapse and, def and, and structural weakness plus asymmetric growth on the articular side and physical damage on the physical side. As we know, if there is any dead bone and dead bony trapeculi, 
um, the oxyclasts will invade this area and they will resolve the dead bone and bone trapecially. And then, at the same time, the osteoblastic function will be stimulated in order to uh, uh, form new bone. Uh, and this is what we call craving substitution or bone resorption formation couple. So the osteoclasts and osteoplastic functions are coupled to, to each other. This is not the case in femoral capital epiphysis in children with Barthes disease. In the vascular stage, there is a pathologic repair process marked by predominant osteoclastic function and resorption and delayed bone formation. And the uncoupling of bone resorption and formation results in dead bone trapically replaced by fibrovascular granulation tissue which would further weaken the femoral head. So, it is very important to remember that there is uncoupling of bone resorption and formation in the femoral head and you don't know the cause and this is one of the bases of biologic treatments in birth disease to use anti-resorptive treatments, anti-resorptive drugs like bisphosphonates and to use BMBs to stimulate bone formation. And then in order to describe in details the um, pathogenesis and the development of femoral head deformity we have to um, divide it into stages. The first stage would be the initial uh, evascular necrosis and with evascular necrosis the, there will be a growth arrest, the osteophic uh, nucleus will be smaller, more dense and there will be a wider cartilage space. Afterwards there will be a revascularization of the cartilage model and there will be an increased bone resorption particularly in the subchondral area and this would cause an increased density centrally within the osteophic nucleus which is called a head within a head sign as described by Salter. So, and then stage 3 will be pathologic fracture in the subchondral area which we call crescent fracture and it's caused by structural weakness from the increased bone resorption in the subchondral area. And this crescent fracture is actually the cause of the symptoms of early parathyroid disease. So until this phase, the abnormality is still clinically silent and we call it potential leg calvary parathyroid disease. But once the subcontral fracture takes place, there will be pain, the resorption of bone underlying the fracture will start and this will cause femoral head fragmentation. According to Salter, true leg calvary parathyroid disease is not simply a vascular necrosis but rather a complication and the complicating factor is the subchondral fracture that initiates bone resorption. So this is the subchondral fracture as you see in this AB view of the right uh, head and this is another um, case and as you see on the left side in the proglata view with the subchondral fracture. Stage 4 will be ephemeral head deformity. So as the pain starts there will be muscle spasms particularly in the adductors and iliosoas, and this would cause adduction, flexion deformity, and anterolateral subluxation of the femoral head. And that's why the lateral edge of the femoral head, which is structurally weak, will be uh, best by the lateral edge of the acetabulum, and this will cause a saddle-shaped femoral head deformity and the development of what we call the abduction hinge. And last, the femoral neck. So the femoral neck deformity. Um, there will be a premature arrest of the capital femoral physis, so the longitudinal growth of the femoral neck will stop, and this will result in short femoral neck. But the abosational growth around the femoral neck will continue, and this will cause enlargement of the femoral neck and the width. And the, on the other side, the greater trochanter above this growth will continue, and the result will be a functional coxavera and an overriding greater trochanter and then a turn the limb bare gate from this functional coxavera and limb less discrepancy from the shortened femoral neck. So this is regarding the femoral side of the disease. Um, in fact, the astabular side is affected as well by the leg carvery parathyroid disease, but it's a secondary affection most of the time. So the um, astabular deformity is well recognized in parathyroid disease and described by a lot of literature we see always in parathyroid disease, establish roof osteoporosis, bicompartmental acetabulum, premature fusion of the lateral cartilage in some cases, and establish dysplasia. So what is the cause of establish deformities in parathyroid disease? According to the paper published by Joseph Benjamin Joseph um, in 1989, he proposed that the synovitis will cause reactive hyperemia and the reactive hyperemia will increase bone resorption around the astabular roof and this will cause osteoporosis of the astabular roof and there will be as well growth alteration because of the hyperemia and synovitis and the growth alteration will cause articular cartilage hypertrophy on the astabular side increased medial joint space as a result will cause growth 
in the region of the triad cartilage, uh, and this will cause by compartmental acetabulum, the mature fusion of the triad cartilage, increased width of the acetabulum, and increased height of the area. And there is another important article published by Chewy from South Korea about the bicompartmental uh, acetabulum and paresis disease, a 3D CT and MRI study. So, first of all, as you know, on the acetabular side, there is a the lunate surface of the acetabular side, which is covered with articular cartilage, and there is a acetabular fossa, which is devoid of articular cartilage. And in the acetabular fossa, we can find soft tissues like pulvinar and ligamentum teres. So, in lacal fibrosis disease, according to Chawi et al., there will be synovitis, which will cause the active hyperemia and growth alteration. The reactive hyperemia will cause deepening of the acetabular fossa by the swollen soft tissue inside it, like bulvinar and like ligamentum teres, and will cause osteoporosis of the acetabular roof. On the other side, growth alteration will cause articular hypertrophy on the femoral and acetabular sides, both of them, and will cause triradid cartilage hypertrophy. And last, lunate surface cartilage hypertrophy, and this will in turn cause lateral displacement of the femoral head. So, in fact, bicompartmental appearance of the acetabulum is not a response of the acetabulum to subluxed femoral head, but rather it develops from an imbalance of the growth between the cartilage covering lunate surface of the acetabulum and the cartilage devoid acetabular fossa. And that's why when we are measuring subluxation of the femoral head, we shouldn't measure it from the femoral head to the medial acetabular uh, wall, but we should measure it from the femoral head to uh, an imaginary arc extending medially and inferiorly from the lateral acetabular pocket. And last, the acetabular dysplasia in lingual paper disease. According to the paper published by Hans Tuck and his colleagues, um, the dysplastic acetabulum um, develops due to primary mechanism and secondary mechanism. The primary mechanism is, in fact, the excessive cartilage growth, as we describe it, caused by the synovitis and the hyperemia. And by a secondary mechanism, which is the femoral head deformity and lateral subluxation. Hans Tuck and his colleagues stressed the uh, fact that early dysplastic changes of the acetabulum were not associated with poor radiological outcomes five years after diagnosis of Perthes disease, and they have emphasized that routine measurements of the acetabular changes in leg calvary Perthes disease were of little prognostic value and can therefore hardly be recommended in clinical practice. So, as you see, this is an X-ray of typical um, uh, uh, significant deformity of bilateral paresis disease. As you see, the saddle-shaped femoral heads, flat femoral heads, aspherical on both sides, shortened femoral necks, uh, overriding greater trochanter, and dysplastic and bicompartmental acetabular surfaces on both sides. Clinical presentation. So, from the clinical point of view, the child is usually present within, between the age of 4 to 8 years, Fairest presentation is usually a limp or a pain in the groin, hip, thigh, or knee regions, and occasionally there will be a history of recent or remote viral illness. From the examination point of view, we will find abnormal gait due to antalgic gait or, or Trendelenburg gait. Range of motion testing of the hip will show decreased abduction and internal rotation and might be affected flexion deformity of the hip. There will be limb length and inequality, which is secondary to um, uh, femoral head collapse, and the presence of hip contracture itself will accentuate the inequality uh, of the limb length. In the physical examination, as we have mentioned, we will see decreased internal rotation, flexor flexion deformity, positive Trendelenburg test, painful hip, atrophy thigh muscles, abduction, range restriction, which is quite important, particularly in follow ups of young children who will be treated conservatively. Then, x-rays and radiography. So, as you know, there is what we call Waldenstrom stages for Perthes disease, which is necrosis, initial stage, revascularization, fragmentation, reossification, and remodeling or healing stage or healed Perthes disease. Uh, we can request bone scans, which would uh, show us a cold lesion, suggesting a decreased blood flow. We can request MRI scans in early uh, cases to diagnose early Perthes disease, which will reveal a decreased tangle intensity in the capital femoral epiphysis and alterations in the uh, in the physial site. 
Um, MRI scans were used as well by Harry Kam and his group in Texas Scott um, the uh, to uh, study the perfusion of the capital epiphysis. And by using a gadolinium lancet MRI, MR images and MR perfusion index, they could um, uh, see that there is a moderate correlation between the early MRI scan appearance and the late uh, head deformity um, uh, after healed Parthes disease. Classification systems. So we have uh, the most famous classification systems are cataract classification 1971, Sultan Thompson 1984, Herring lateral pillar classification 1992, and Stuhlberg classification 1981. In cataract classification, it is um, a classification of the Parthes disease according to the areas um, uh, affected in the capital epiphysis. So in group one, it's an anterior affection or anterior involvement in group 2, it's an anterior and central involvement in group 3, it's most of the capital epiphysis, but sparing the medial and lateral parts, and in group 4, it's the entire epiphysis. Uh, Catherine in his paper, uh, this is uh, one of the, his original uh, tables, uh, he pointed out the importance of um, the extent of necrosis and sequestration of the femoral head um, and the late outcomes. So, as you see from this table, most of the good results are in groups 1 and 2, and most of the poor results are in groups 3 and 4. But the main issue with um, cataract classification is that um, the inter-observer reliability is very, very poor. Cataract as well documented the head at risk signs, and these are five signs. First, the gauge sign, which is uh, first described by Gage, Courtney Gage in 1933, and it is a small osteotic segment V-shaped like defect in the lateral side of the epiphysis. And these head at signs are prognostic, poor prognostics um, uh, in Parathis disease. The second sign is described by Cuttle himself in 1971, which is a calcification lateral to the epiphysis. The third sign is the lateral subluxation of the uh, femoral head. Number four, uh, the angle of the epiphyseal line, which if, if it is horizontal, this will cause uh, more shielding forces on the uh, epiphysis and the femoral head and would encourage lateral displacement and subluxation. And then there will be a research from Loader which, uh, in which they have measured the normal femoral shaft by this angle and they found in the AB view of the pelvis and they found that the normal range is between 61 to 73 and if the growth plate is uh, angle is more than 73, it is considered as horizontal. And last, diffuse metaphysical reaction um, as a, a sign of physical damage as described by Smith et al. in 1982. The second classification system that we know is Salters and Thompson. And Salters and Thompson classification system, it, it's mainly reliant on the early identification of the subcondylar fracture. And if the subcondylar fracture is less than 50% and it's group A and corresponds to cattle groups 1 and 2 and if it is more than 50% it's group B and corresponds to cattle groups 3 and 4. And last, the lateral pillar classification system according to Herring and his group in Texas Scottish Rite which is first described in 1992 and according to this classification lateral pillar is defined as the lateral 15 to 30% of the femoral head according to the original paper in 1992. And and Herring divided the lateral pillar into three categories. Group A, no loss in the height of the lateral pillar. Group B, less than 50% involvement of the lateral pillar, so the lateral pillar loss of height is not exceeding 50%. Group C, the lateral pillar height loss is more than 50%. Then there was a modification of the lateral pillar classification by Herring himself and Harry Kim, and it was published in 2004. And according to this new modified lateral pillar, they have redefined the lateral pillar as it is the lateral portion of the femoral head which is demarcated from the central portion of the head by the lucent line of fragmentation. And this would represent about 5 to 30% of the femoral head. And if we cannot see a lucent line of fragmentation, then it will be the lateral one fourth, 25, 25% of the femoral head. And in the modified lateral pillar classification, they have added a fourth group, which is group BC. So in patients with group BC, the lateral pillar is very narrow, two to three millimeters wide, or the lateral pillar 
shows very little ossification or the lateral pillar is exactly 50% of the original height. So this is what we call the lateral pillar classification system according to Herring et al. And then we have an, um, another important modification of our understanding of how to classify Peirce's disease and the stages. And this modification is proposed by Joseph et al. Uh, in one of the largest cohorts of Peirce's disease published in the literature. So they have reviewed uh, the radiographs and records of six and, uh, 610 cases from India. And they have proposed a modification to Elizabethtown classification um, by Canel et al. And the original classification classifies peripheral disease to stage 1 sclerosis, stage 2 fragmentation, stage 3 healing, and stage 4 reossification. So, Joseph et al. have subdivided each category into A and B. So, stage 1, which is the sclerosis, it will be stage 1A. So, the part, part of the whole epiphysis is sclerotic, but there is no loss of height. And stage 1B, there is loss of height but there is no evidence of fragmentation. And stage 2a, uh, the sclerotic epiphysis just began to fragment. And so we will see one or two vertical fissures in the uh, anteroposterior or the lateral views. And stage 2b, there is an advanced fragmentation uh, in the femoral capital epiphysis, uh, as visible in the uh, AB and lateral views. And stage 3a, there is early new bone formation and early uh, reossification and healing, which is visible in the periphery of the necrotic epiphysis, but it's still osteoporotic and it covers less than a third of the width, width of the epiphysis. And in stage 3b, the new bone is of normal texture and has grown over a third of the capital epiphysis, and in stage 4, it's fully healed Perthes disease. So, what are the drawbacks of the current Perthes disease classification systems? The main and most important is that the extent and the course of the disease cannot be predicted early enough before significant femoral deformity takes place. However, in fact, Salter and Thompson classification system might be one of the most useful classifications as it gives an early insight about the extent of affection of the capital epiphysis by means of assessing the extent of subchondral fracture. But it is estimated that subchondral fracture would be seen in only 20% of patients who are suffering of leg calvipartheus disease. Furthermore, according to the results of Benjamin Joseph, deformation of the epiphysis occurs either during the late stage of fragmentation or the, in the early stage of revascularization, so stage 2b or stage 3a, and therefore containment surgery should be done before stage 2b. And last, stool reclassification, which is a classification of the healed parathyroid disease according to the femoral head shape and deformity. So class 1 is a normal hip, class 2 the head is spherical, but mildly larger than the normal side, and it fills within 2 mm of a concentric circle in both AB and lateral views. In class 3, it's an oval or mushroom or umbrella-shaped head, but not flat, and it will be more than 2 mm if we are drawing a concentric circle. And stage 4, it's a flat femoral head and acetabulum, both of them are congruent with the, each other. And in stage 5, it's a flat femoral head, but normal acetabulum and femoral neck so it's aspherical and incongruent. In fact, stupid classification system can be grouped in two, two main groups. The first group is spherical femoral head, which is class 1 and 2, and aspherical femoral head, which is classes 3, 4, and 5. One of the important articles published by Larson et al. showed that only spherical stupid classes 1 and 2 femoral heads had low rate of secondary degenerative osteoarthritis at the time of 20 years follow-up after Perthes disease. But the rate of osteoarthritis was high in Sturberg classes 3 and 4 and 5 following non-operative treatment. Thank you.